Disasters are unexpected. The violence of nature, the violence of humanity, creates disorder. Disorder because of wars, because of famines, because of hurricanes. Disorder because of pandemics. Now is the time for those on the front line to bear witness. When we were watching the news from Wuhan, and it just looked absolutely surreal. We knew it was potentially coming here, but not realising what the impact would be, despite seeing how it had devastated parts of China. You know, we were getting stories from Italy, stories from Spain. We could see the health systems crumbling under the, the weight of care that was required and the, the absence of adequate resources. And you start to think, why aren't we being a bit more proactive? I don't think we took it serious enough. We didn't look at what was going on in the rest of the world. We were all lost, kind of. Going to work every day is always like, um, you have the, this panic attack in you. You have this, um, your, your body feels hot right from inside because it's like a battle zone. Every day comes with a different challenge. You don't know what you're going to face today. Was that a constant change on a daily basis? We didn't have a clue. We need to start to use this mask. It was like, God, am I going to take COVID to my family? I was so scared. It was like going, you know, like going to a battlefield, I would say, and just walking without knowing what you're going to do or if your mask goes down, what will happen? Will you get it? Will you be taking the virus home? Will you die? It got to a point when I heard the news of the first case in my unit, I was like, no, I just need to do something and I need to do it fast before I take COVID back home. And I've got an eight-year-old boy at home each time I come back home, he run towards me, want to collect my bag, want to kiss mommy, want to hug mommy. So I have to hide when I get back home because you don't want them. To, you don't want to say, "Oh, um, you can't hug mommy." So you have to instead of coming through the front door, I come in through the back door. From my back door, I remove, undress myself, then run to the shower before I allow my son to see me. That I find quite very challenging. And then the next thing will ask you, oh, mommy, what part of the body did you fix today? Who did you treat today? What did you do at work today? You can't say, um, actually, I lost about six people today. You can't say that to them. You just have to lie. Oh, everybody is fine. Meanwhile, you're not fine. You're thinking about, about that somebody's father you think you could have saved, you could have done this for, that you, 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 you couldn't do it because the, uh, the, the resources weren't there. Then you come on my lie to your child, oh yeah, 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 I'm fine, I'm okay, but you're not fine. You're not fine. We feel cheated by death when it comes before its time. We feel cheated by life when we know the dying could be saved. The numbers escalated. The fragile were unprotected. As the most vulnerable died, those who cared for them kept on giving and giving. On this particular day, I went to work and they said, Rosalind, you're looking after so, so so bed number. I said, fine, but she's not good. She's not going to make it. You can imagine they're telling you, you're going to look after a life, but she's not going to make it. You just feel, you feel broken yourself. But at the same time, you have to be strong for these people. We can't cry. Although sometimes we do cry. You cry, it's not because they're dying. It's because they're dying and dying alone. The thing that broke my heart was, the patients had no family to be there when they passed away. They couldn't hold their hands. You become their, their relative, you become their mom, 
you become their husband, you become their dad. Some of them, you read Bible to them as per instruction given by the family. You read Bible, you read Quran, you become a hairdresser, have done a lot of makeup <laughs> in ITU, do their hair, make them feel like a normal human being. But it was really heartbreaking for the families, for us to see that, and for the poor dying patients as well, which, which was really traumatic for me. Things are just churning in your mind. The rate of death was really quick. You turn your back and the patient had died. It was that fast for some of the patients and a lot of my nurses, and they, they were traumatized by that. We're, we're used to death. We are used to caring for patients because that's what we're here to do. But the pace was really, really fast. This particular patient, the husband was there. And then he said, Rosie, do you think my wife will make it? What do I say? I can't lie. Or you can say, I'm not sure. It depends on how your wife responds to the treatment we're giving her. I was at work and you could see people from all walks of life just dying left, right and centre. And this time it was scarier because they were younger. Your oxygen saturation should be 100%. If it's not 100%, then we start to titrate oxygen for you from 21%, 30%, 40%. It goes up, up, till it goes to 100. Once we give you 100% oxygen and your oxygen saturation is still 60, it's still 50, I'm sorry, your lungs is gone. So that's what exactly what's happened to that patient. Close around lunchtime, she, we have to phone different people to say we have to switch off everything. So once they switch off everything, that's it. They just gradually go. And you can't leave them to go alone. You have to be there. They go in front of you. At one point, I didn't want to come home. So during the first wave, uh, we were offered hospital accommodation or other accommodation where we could stay. And um, I stayed in the hospital accommodation to protect my family, actually. So every morning we have to use the iPad to, to, to show the husband lying with intubated. It's not a very good sight to see as a family. Then she'll just start singing from the other end, singing Jesus song. And for all that are believers, when I hear anybody sing Jesus song that is pertaining to death, oh my goodness. And the old place just busted into, all of us just started crying. And the gentleman was dying. So we have to hold the, the, the high pad with all the family, about 10 or 50 of them in the room. They were all singing, praising God, that we know you're going to accept him into your hand. He's going. Meanwhile, he's dying someone need to look after them and it's already hard for them to have this COVID and you know to struggle they don't know what is going on they can have partners there they can have anyone there someone need to do it the doctors have to be there the nurses have to be there to say even though we're losing some hi guys there are some people that are making it there are people that we intubate a couple of days for um, 10 days, 14 days, they come back to life. When we see those Sussex stories, he makes us very happy. The shock doctrine. Chaos for some is an opportunity for others. Collective shock creates national trauma. At that point, those with political power must decide if they are going to serve themselves or if they are going to serve the people. Exploitation or protection. We just didn't seem to be able to make enough PPE. We weren't able to get the right PPE. We were getting members from the BAME community, black nurses, saying, I have to take my own PPE when I go into work in this care home because there isn't any, or I'm being deployed to work on a COVID ward. 
And then you start to see images of the people who died, you know, healthcare professionals who died from COVID. And, and I started to think, this is just me because I'm black, only noticing the black faces that were coming up on the news. And there were just more and more and more black doctors, black nurses, black support workers. And, and it, it was just like, you know, come on, Stephanie, you're just being paranoid here. And I remember saying to one, I was talking to one of my regional director colleagues and he said, have you noticed? And I said, I have. The information wasn't very transparent about who was dying and the numbers of staff who were dying. And I did my own count and I made my own list. And I had a list around April or May of 200 staff that had died. And then I looked at the nurses and I counted over 70 nurses and barring three, they were all black, Asian. You're just seeing black people, black people, Asian, black people. You would see a few white people, but all of them were carers. They were in lower paid jobs. They weren't in upper management jobs. And these people were dying. It became quite apparent that there was a disproportionate number of um, particularly nurses of colour and doctors as well um, that were being impacted, that were losing their lives on the front line um, due to COVID. And I remember uh, challenging the seniors and saying like, if you're asking me to look after a COVID positive, I probably need to use FPP3 mask because it makes more sense, you know, the patient should, you know, to wear it as well. And they said, no, this is not in the guideline. So it was everything on need to be based on the guideline. It wasn't a common sense. I was um, allocated to a COVID ward and I was not given protection. Um, I asked for a, um, like a proper filtered mask and I was told I can't have it because I will scare people. And then they put me into a ward where I was looking after a patient um, with COVID, but they wouldn't allow me to have, um, like they'd only give me a surgical mask. And then there was other times where um, they would tell me to reuse my mask. You want me to reuse my mask? I've been touching patients with COVID. I've been touching my mask. And you want me to go on break, hang the mask somewhere, and the, the PPE somewhere, come back and put it back on again. So we all said, no, we're not going to reuse our PPE. And it became a national issue. And obviously being black with Afro hair, you know, could never get like head protection. You know, they've got these little things like shower caps, but if you got braids in, you just couldn't, you know, I ended up having to improvise and use like um, yellow clinical bags to put over my hair because they just didn't, nobody cared that these hat, these equipment wasn't suitable for us. Even knowing that our risk of developing COVID-19 was so high, nobody seemed to be talking about it. And the nurses were saying when they were putting these masks on, another reason why a lot of us were, were dropping dead was because we didn't fit, we didn't fit, our, we had different shaped noses, so it didn't fit us properly. So I was having masks that were like hanging off or not quite on or loose and moving around and the PPE wasn't made for someone who wore things differently or did things differently. We would be more affected by COVID-19 than other groups, but yet we were the groups that were asked to go and work on the COVID wards. I have two cousins, one friend, and they were all gone asked, black friend nurses that were asked to work on COVID-19. And I'm asking why, and I'm saying why? <laughs> and not, and actually getting really angry. If you are black or brown person, you're more you know, exposed to the COVID and people they're talking about it in the hospitals and when after I had my risk assessment, I've been told to avoid. And when a few times I've been asked to look after a COVID, I said, no, I'm sorry, I can't. I've been even questioned why. Just because you are brown midwife, this is why. Is any other reason? I was scared um, because I couldn't understand why you'd want to do that. Why would you send somebody? It's almost like sending someone to their death. That's what I felt they were doing. When the first risk assessments came out, there was no reference to uh, black, ethnic, Asian minority communities at all. And we knew then in April and May, there were two 
um, particular studies, the Office of National Statistics and the Institute of Fiscal Studies that clearly show the disproportionate impact on um, black Asian uh, communities. So it wasn't there. Was it because we're undervalued that they didn't step up to ensure that we were protected? Because that's what it feels like. You know, there was one hospital that I worked at and I did notice that the matron was selecting who she gave PPE to. So, you know, certain things like um, the face mask, she, they, would, they would have it stored and I would just become acutely aware that some people got more um, access to PPE than others. At first I thought it was might be because I'm an agency nurse, but then I started to realise that not just I'm an agency nurse, but some the white staff were getting more equipment. Borders are methods of human control. You leave a country to work because a family relies on you. Freedom depends on the colour of your skin. Visas and work permits distort people into commodities. Your body is tolerated. Your value is economic. Cheap labour under pressure. Staff said that uh, they were being threatened with their work permits to be revoked during that time as well. We had several of those and several of the staff said that they couldn't challenge the decision because if they challenge the decision, they will be faced with disciplinary, bullying, harassment, um, lots of other HR uh, processes. I have to be like, be a good girl and just follow whatever they tell me. So I have no reason to fight back to them because I am desperate for this. So whatever they tell me to do, I have to do it. You know, they have been forced sometimes to go to specific area of work that they didn't have enough protection. And we have to come in because we don't want to be like, uh, to be punished or whatever, you know, because they can just easily uh, send us home. So that was the fear. I had to tell them, at the end of the day, I'm just a number. I'm just a number. Because if anything happens to me, or happens to my family, it's not going to be so long before you take someone else to replace me. What politicians call collateral damage is not a byproduct of conflict, it is a strategy of fear. What can be prevented is let loose to create panic. The game of acceptable numbers is played. How many will be sacrificed? 1,000? 10,000? 100,000? I told my husband, I have to isolate myself because I have a high temperature and I'm very short of breath. So being alone in the room is really, really scary. I am thinking because seeing the news on where most of the people are affected are Filipinos and Africans and the people are just dying in their room, in their bedrooms. And even if they call 999, nobody, you know, will come and, and take them because the hospital, they said just to isolate yourself and stay at home. So I was at that point that, oh my God, I'm going to die. And then I was documenting myself. I said, if ever I will die, at least they have something to, to look at me. In my, my mobile phone, so I'm like, if I'm really feeling that. I'm going to go, I'll just say goodbye, and at least they have something. So I really feel isolated, obviously. I don't want my kids to get it, and, and, and my husband. Beforehand, as I was uh, waiting for the call for the director, the director of nursing, uh, he phoned me. I said, uh, sir, can I have a, a COVID swab? I wanted to be tested because I know that this is COVID. But he said no. So I questioned him. I said, why is it then that uh, the other staff are being swabbed and why I am not being swabbed? We never really get the, the right response uh, to these questions. Uh, why people? Why and who determines who will die and who will not die? Why is it that we have to suffer like this? Why is it that some of the people are being swabbed and why is it? What's the reason? behind why we are not swab? Is it because we are not that 
the top bosses or is it because we are different color? Oppression is felt by those it touches and encouraged by those that refuse to see it. The separation of races, apartheid, is all around. You just need to know how to look. Colonies were established with the mentality of white supremacy and colonial attitudes are persistent. In a and they divide the a and &E into different sections. They say the red area and the green area. All the black nurses were always allocated in the red area. Black and brown nurses were more likely to be allocated to work on the front line. And that I found was cultural and it wasn't just one hospital. So I'd work in hospitals in London and see that pattern. And I would work in a couple of um, hospitals in Surrey, I'd see the same pattern. And then what I would do is I just started to talk to some of the black nurses about it. And they also noticed as well. So we'd noticed that in the areas that were less um, dangerous, um, there was less blacks. The matron will tell you you're not allowed to wear the FFP3 mask you have to wear the, the normal mask. The reason why the FFP3 mask is there is to prevent you catching COVID from these people. So why are you saying we shouldn't wear it? So on a, one night, I had a big argument with the matron. I knew that if I was in the shift, if it was any COVID positive, it was going to be mine. And it was true. <laughs> I needed to look after the COVID positive. If you bring a, a, a white a patient in front of me, do I discriminate? I don't. I give everybody the same treatment according to their illnesses. So why should you discriminate against us? Because we are black nurses looking for our daily bread. You can't say anything because they tell you you've got a chip on your shoulder. They say you're playing the race card. You know, you can't have those conversations because then they will ostracise you. Teamwork is very important in our industry. They'll say you're a bad team player. So a lot of nurses just don't say anything. A lot of nurses just suffer in silence. So in the end, what they, they, they decide to do, if you're doing five nights or you're doing four nights or five days, they'll put you three days in the red zone and the other two days you go to the green zone. So that's how they decide to split it in the end, when all of us decide to speak up. In the middle of the pandemic, they were put somewhere that was so acute and so not what they were used to. So not only were they being put at risk because of their um, the vulnerabilities, but also in terms of their skills. Some of my colleagues were being, you know, like moved to the high risk area. They were not given the choice where they want to work. They always say you are contracted in the hospital. You are not contracted to any ward, so you can go. If you refuse, um, you know, that's you going to HR to get referred and that's on your file. You cannot refuse. So they're saying that it's only like temporary, but then come six months, a year, they're still there. They're still letting us go into those areas. They're still letting us work the long hours and they're still expecting it from us, but they're not sort of extra protecting us, even though they know we're more at risk. I've had colleagues that have died of COVID and they were not risk assessed and they were forced to go onto the front line. Even um, nurses that we know that had, had asked not to be put on the front line because they had underlying conditions were still put on the front line and unfortunately they've passed away. Across the land, there were morgues full of corpses. There were eyes full of tears. There were prayers, laments. There were curses, there was pain at the deaths, made worse by the cold separation. People died lonely, away from love. The impact of seeing um, black colleagues dying of um, COVID has been um, devastating. It, it has a ripple effect because these nurses look like us. And we almost feel that if there was an issue, 
that affected white nurses in the same way that COVID is affecting us, I don't think that it would just be left to chance. We are the ones on the shop floor. If you look across the workforce, there is a lack of representation in senior positions. So most of the workforce who are from these communities are actually working on the, on the front line. Whether it be doctors, nurses, midwives, we are on the front line. Decades ago, the mother country called, and some came, to work in factories, to keep transport moving, to take care of our national health. There were promises. There was hope. My training was very traditional. It was the old state registered nurse type training, very much an apprenticeship model, if you like. And they just give you a task to do. So for the day, you'd be doing blood pressures or you'd be doing getting people ready for theatre. There was only one way to make a bed. And we even got diagrams on how to fold the dirty linen before we disposed of it into the trolley. And if you were caught making it the wrong way, you had to remake the bed and do it again, strip it again properly. So it was very, very um, directed around um, discipline and following the rules and doing what you were told. Some nurses treated you well, some not so well. She stood at the end of the ward and shouted, Nurse Weather, this isn't done and that isn't done and why haven't you done that? And I went, I think about that. So I followed her down the ward. I was so, so angry. Followed her down the ward into the kitchen and she turned around a bit surprised to see me and I said, if you've got anything to say to me, you call me in the office and talk to me. Do not shout my name down the ward. I think from the beginning, you always know that if you are a person of colour, that there are certain expectations and you know that you have to work doubly or triply hard. All the black nurses on the, ended up on the elderly wards where it was the harder, more, and I use the word, labour intensive. So there is this particular nurse, she's always on my case. When I ask you to calculate drug for me, you don't know anything, you're so useless, you're so... She wouldn't use the word, you're a black girl. She say, people like you. She kept using that particular word, people like you. Everything was absolutely fine. Made a few friends on the course. Everything was fine. I just had to take it up to my link lecturer to say, I don't understand the meaning of people like you. If I've got a name. Everybody, as a nurse, you all have a name tag. My name is Rosalind. Re please refer to me as Rosalind. Don't keep saying people like her, people like you. What does that mean? Yeah, there was quite a lot of racism and discrimination, which I wasn't overly aware of in first year, maybe. But when I went on to placements, that's when I started to really notice them. Then we got our placements through and we were all excited. You get like the email, you log in, shows you where you're going. I had Ripley Community Hospital, so I thought, I've never even heard of that. So I Googled it. And one of the first things that came up was like that it was like the UK's most racist town. Um, and sometimes it was just small things that were said to me like um, that I should be grateful really that I've been given the opportunity to do it. You know, we were like cleaning down the rooms, we were cleaning the blinds, we were sanitising, flipping the mattresses, all of that, washing the patients. And a lot of the time, the white students would be in the staff room or in the office eating pizza with the feet up. When I challenged it and said, look, you know, the, the, the majority of white students are in the birth centre where it's, everything is nice, low risk, and you get wonderful births and really relaxed environment. And a lot of other black, midwife, black student midwives are having nine weeks of nights, uh, purely night shifts, not being paid, you know, just like... Having a really high risk environment with, you know, nurses that are not always supportive, um, it, it, there is a disparity here. A patient came in, we were doing care for him, oh, he was assigned to me, and then there was this whole thing of he didn't want me because I was black. So they, the nurses said, you, you know, like, well, if you just know it, don't, don't care for him. Like, he, he, you, you know, he doesn't want you to, so you'll have to have this patient instead. And I was just, I was just so, so hurt by that. I just think, you know, it's the NHS, you don't get to make that choice. Um, I'm here, I'm here to care for you, I'm going to do it properly. 
and you don't want me to do that. And it was just the fact that I think what was more hurtful than anything was the fact that no one stuck up for me. You know, I was in a cohort of midwives that were mostly white British um, and they seemed to excel and they seemed to thrive where I seemed to struggle. Um, I used to get feedback from my mentors, which was challenging. It was just really difficult. You know, it got to the point where I was going in the shower every morning, clumps of my hair were falling out. My nose was bleeding every day. It was just absolutely ridiculous. It was at the point where you just don't eat because I don't, you know, I'm going to go into the staff room and everyone's going to walk out or everyone's going to stop talking as soon as I go in there. You know, you have to edit everything you say everywhere you go according to who you're talking to. Nothing was dealt with properly, none of the complaints, none of what I had to say. It was just always, uh, you know, you need to just get on with it. So uh, If you don't tra um, transfer your proper skills to this student nurse, what are they going to become tomorrow? So you have to facilitate a good learning environment for the student. The fact of blackness is distorted to suit the needs of whiteness. Prejudice is a burden that confuses the past, threatens the future, and renders the present inaccessible. If you're a black nurse in the UK, your experience of being a nurse is going to be very different to that of your white counterpart. If it's a patient with particular situation, like um, if as a patient with HIV positive, for example, that is yours because you're African like her and probably you have the same. So you take her, we are not going to take her. Midwives who wear the hijab, for instance, being told that, oh, do you come from a terrorist background because they wear a hijab? So things on that line and facing discrimination, facing racial comments all the time. We were in a very inner city area and we had very few children from black or ethnic minority backgrounds use our service. And it was almost like it was a cure for child illness. You know, if you were black or Asian or whatever, you, you didn't get ill. They didn't use our, our inpatient service to the same extent, even though they were present in the community. And I just wanted to find out why and what was, were there barriers to people accessing our services? And the conversation I had with this particular paediatrician was that, oh, I wouldn't waste your money doing something like that. You need all the time during the shift to be the one working harder than anyone else. At the beginning, you think because I'm new midwife, they want me to learn. But then you realise it's not that. I've said, oh, I'm really tired today, or I seem to have more patience than you. I've had comments like, it beats being a slave. Um, that it's pretty difficult to deal with. How you can fight that, how you can challenge that, you can't. Because if you challenge it, they will say, this is what you think is not true. You always see racism everywhere. I was told, you should think yourself lucky you've got this job. There was 30 other applicants and we gave it to you. And I said, well, I think that's because I've worked really hard and I had the knowledge and the skills. No, it's nothing to do with that. It's to tick the boxes it's because of your ethnicity. I remember literally feeling completely like, um, I'm never gonna go for another job. You do not necessarily feel welcome. You have this constant voice behind you that's making you slightly paranoid. It was devastating, but also embarrassing. I felt like really ashamed and I didn't know who to talk to about it. So I didn't know whether to go home and say, like somebody said this, am I being over, am I overreacting or not? Um, I did seek help and I went to speak to somebody that was higher up about it and they just dismissed it really and said I was probably being oversensitive. When I first qualified, I got my first job and that was in a hospice. And I remember working in there and then when I started to pick up some cues that the people that I was working with didn't like me, I left straight away because I felt that it was too dangerous because all it takes is for one colleague or one senior person to not like you and because your skin is black, you're going to get it. 
it was like it all got too much. I had to, it was like a breakdown, really. I didn't know who I was as a person anymore. And I was like, I can't be a brown person. <laughs> no way. Like, it's the world doesn't want me. Um, it, it's quite upsetting, really. Um, just because I think as a mum, you realise that you don't want your child to feel anything that you felt. But you also want them to be proud of who they are and where they come from. We've got black nurses that can't even... You know, they change their name to adapt to the environment. You know, they might have a very African sounded name. That's not so um, easy to pronounce, but they would change their name. You know, we've got black nurses that can't even go into work with their national dish because the like the, the colleagues will say, you know, the food smells and stuff like that. That is um, not right. That That's not acceptance. That's, that's not acceptance at all. I've had um, staff that have... Um, been at the point of self-harm because of the degree of bullying and harassment. When you get so broken and broken to bits, you don't look after yourself. You don't look after your health because you're told that you don't matter. And because they care less for you, you're almost careless with your own health. Working in the NHS, the, the most overwhelming emotion I get is just exhaustion. I'm tired. How much more can I pull up with this? How much more do I have to work with this? Is nursing even worth carrying on to work with? You feel lonely. And, and then you just think, what can I do? What shall I do? To reach the top of the mountain, we must march towards the clouds. The struggle is not for one day or one week or one year. It is already many generations old, but it must continue. As long as there is suppression, there will be the desire to overcome. It's like we're in two different worlds. Meanwhile, we do the same job. For example, if there's a post, a band six post or a band seven post coming up, they'll rather give it to the, the white nurse than to give it to a black nurse just because they see us as we're second best. We are not second best. It's when you want to step up, when you can really face the problem because again, you're the last in the list. You can't... Uh, in competition with your colleagues, you need to wait and always wait, wait, wait. It's taken me a long time to get to where I am now. I'm, I'm currently working as a band seven. I qualified as a nurse in 2009. It's now 2021 and I'm still a band five, which is what we start as. I have been a nurse for over 14, 15 years when I applied and still I couldn't progress but newly qualified English nurses would be within two or three years they will be bad sevens and I'm like I could do that I could do that I want to I want to do that band seven but they did not fill the post all that second band sevens work was being diverted to me I would say um, the others were given the opportunity but not me or my other colleagues from overseas this went on and I went to HR to say, look, I want to raise an informal concern. I do feel oppressed because my job is being held. Uh, and they immediately got around and said, well, you, you can't, you've got to decide. This is to senior management, HR have said, you've got to decide. And within a week after that, I had a permanent contract. And they give you a feedback and tell you, oh, somebody did a little bit better than you. I didn't serve you, and so we've offered that if we had if we had had funding for two people, we would have taken you next. And I say that with my other colleagues that are Africans, Asian, and they look, eh, is it the same thing they say to you all too? And some of them will say, I've heard it like a hundred times. We know that nurses of colour don't progress within the NHS, just like a lot of institutions. Um, actually, there needs to be some targets in there, and if they're not met, then there needs to be some sanctions around that.
Not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced. Every act of aggression is noted, remembered or resisted, individually, collectively. Neutrality is no longer an option. Change is made by any means necessary. Nursing comes from your heart. We don't do it for the money. We don't do it for any um, validation. We do it because it's our calling. Our soul is calling us to help others. And that's what we want to do. I don't feel that um, we should be forced out of a profession that we, you know, some of us are born wanting to be nurses. Why should we be persecuted? Why should we be attacked? Why can't we just be nurses? Why can't we just get our patient loads, look after our patients and go home? I took a patient from my gynecology ward to a theatre. And the sister of that theatre, she, I went with a white girl. Sorry, my language, white girl. I went with a, another a white girl. She's a student. She was my student. I was the nurse. So she, she saw two of us and she turned around and started talking to the white girl. She thought I was a student because I'm a black nurse. And then she's asking her question. And when they finish, the student just turned around and looked at me. I said, yeah, you can answer her. She's talking to you. She decided to over, overlook me because I'm a black nurse. And then she turned around and I said, I like you. That's the manager now. She said, I like your courage. A lot of people don't stand up to me. I said, why do you just assume I'm a, because it's because I'm black or because I look young? It just would be nice to see more different people in higher roles and be able to go, wow, you've done that, you know. And it's not just because of your ethnicity, it's because you deserve to be in that role. So she said, okay, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to do that. So how are you the nurse? I said, yes, I am the nurse. I've come to collect my patient. And then you turn around chatting to the, the, the student nurse but just because she's white, like yourself. She said, oh, I'm really sorry. There is a job going on. Would you like to apply for the job? And I said, I just gave her a big hug. I said, yes. That's my big dream. I've been wanting to be a theatre practitioner. Please, I will take the job. She said, oh, that's fine. It's a sweet um, transition because you're in the trust already. I'm going to speak to your manager right now. So you just go, just prepare your mind that you're coming to work in theatre for me. I wanted my colleague to be aware about what's mean races. I wanted them to know that Fatima, their colleague, yeah, she experienced the racism before. It's not something they hear just in the TV. It's something real is next to them. And I started just talking, just having normal conversations to make everyone aware. Because I think I'm not judging anyone. Even the racist people don't judge them. If you are racist because probably you're ignorant about something, let's talk. You probably you will not change your mind, but let's talk. And and since then, you become an open conversation. Sometimes I think, oh, maybe if I don't pay attention to the racism, I'll be OK. But then you turn around and you look at the nurse who's only been qualified one or two years, who's starting to get some of the, you know, maybe the racism, racism abuse. And then you hear the stories that come through and you think, no, I can't, I can't sit back. You've, you've, got to, you've got to fight this. I like to ping things out to say, this is wrong, this is right. Whatever you think needs to be fixed, you fixed it. Don't discriminate and say, because she's black, so I'm not going to fix her. No, I'm black, you're white, you fixed both of us together. COVID was the catalyst that made us appear, you know? Made us come out and reach out and speak out. If you don't speak louder, they're not going to hear you. They're going to be thinking, oh, she's fine, he's all right. They can do it, she can do it. No, we can't. We are scared. Even though we are putting our life at, uh, on the line for this patient, for your mom, for your dad, for your relative, we too, we go home to a dad, to a husband, to a child, to a relative. So they have to put us into that consideration as well that these people, they're looking after sick people, not just sick people, COVID, not just COVID, deadly virus. 
viral that will catch you, you can die anytime. So we're sticking our neck out for these people. So I said to them, please, we blackness, we, are, we like to refer to ourselves, my sister, when we see our work, oh, my sister, you're here today. Please, sister, speak up. We have to hold management accountable because they are giving out sort of, they are saying that, yes, we've got all these structures in place to deal with these, the HR um, uh, structures, um, everything is there. But actually, it's just a tick box exercise. If I don't do it, what about my patients? Because my patients could be my sister, my mother, my brother. So you have to keep fighting against it. You have to be their advocate because who will do it for you? I always say that I'm doing this for my children because they will live here in the UK. I might be gone, but I have something for them to, to say that my mom fight for me, fight for my equality, fight for me not to be treated like she was treated before. So that's why I keep on fighting and I keep on believing that someday, one day, we will be all equal. Black and brown nurses need their own organisation so that they can be allowed a voice together. Um, what we're finding is there's themes, common themes, across the, across the country and collectively they become a loud voice because at the moment they're fragmented, but together we're all saying the same thing. Our experiences are mirror images of each other. Even as many struggled to save lives, others were still killing. Time is on the side of the oppressed today. It's against the oppressor. Truth is on the side of the oppressed today. It's against the oppressor. You don't need anything else. Here we saw in broad daylight the murder of a, uh, a black man in the public and that image went globally. For me it's like reopening a wound that is still bleeding and I think during the COVID this is what, it, what I felt with George Floyd as well was a bleeding inside, the wound was open again. You know you cry out of anger, you cry out of sadness, you cry out of frustration and tears of how many, you know, have we got to put up with this anymore? We're not going to put up with this anymore. Like a virus left unchecked spreads, causes harm. Racism, like a virus, spreads and causes significant harm. And what manifested itself to me um, following the death of George Floyd were the number of people who had been significantly damaged because of racism in their past. It was a turning point about the discourse and the level of conversation and dialogue that we as a nation have around race. As time went on, people that wouldn't ordinarily speak spoke. It was really strange to go to work because it was like a silence. And I know why. It's not because George Floyd died for racism because we were admitting there is racism and someone needed to face this conversation again. Black Lives Matter inspired me so much so that I felt that this is a platform, this is an opportunity and a chance for me to speak out about the injustices that I've lived with from the day I was born in this country. I had colleague who they cried listening to me because they never thought that I was one of the victims of the racism. Um, midwife asking what is the best thing to do, how to raise their own kids, you know, to, to know, you know, to fight the racism. Um, you know, and that for me was amazing to see. It allowed me to have conversations which I never, ever thought I would have with my white colleagues. So, yeah, it really inspired me because what's happened is we was suffering in silence. I'm glad they're speaking out. You know, I'm glad that they're, they're doing things about it, saying we do matter because we tried and we just got knocked down, you know, and, and we got told to toe the line um, for the same, same things, you know, same reason. 
and I'm still not ready to give up. In light of the George Floyd and the, the Black Lives movement, that seems to be irritating a lot of people within the service. And um, we're getting a lot of references to the Black Lives movement. Um, like some healthcare assistants and nurses are saying to black nurses, you know, this is unnecessary. This, you know, why, why does it, why does it have to be black lives matter? Why can't we all matter? And it almost seems like a lot of people are just ignorant to the problems and the issues that black nurses face. So we're not saying that white nurses don't matter, but black nurses have a specific issue that needs to be dealt with and the discrimination that is um, channeled and projected to them has become pandemic. In terms of the George Floyd situation, of course that happens. It happens in this country. That is, it's an institution. It's not built for us, so of course it's not going to work for us. Sometimes there was admiration and respect. Heroes, but just for one day. A remembrance of the dead. A symbolic appreciation for the living for those on the front line. Symbols are important, but just like statues, sometimes they must be toppled. Yes, it was nice to see like communities coming together and clapping and saying, yay, the NHS. But then I was also battling this, like the racism that you experience every day in the NHS and that actually I'm not a valued member of staff. It, it's good they're clapping for us, but where is the clap now? It's gone. But if he has given us money, we have, we'll have used the money to do something, to go on holiday, to, to make, put a smile on, the, on our family faces. People were clapping, I was dying inside. Because, why? What does it mean clapping? You're not giving me anything with the clapping. You're not giving me anything. I also found it completely upsetting that every single thing I'd see on the news, when they put nurses outside, they would never have any black or mixed nurses anywhere it, or doctors, yet you knew that they were the ones that were working so hard because you were seeing how many of them were dying. I feel very concerned and saddened for families that have to listen to this, who have lost loved ones, um, particularly when you get you know, the ministerial advisor saying lots of people died unnecessarily um, because of the lies and lack of preparedness. You know, everything aside, that's not something a bereaved family needs to hear or should ever have to hear. You can't wait for people to die to realise that there is inequalities in the system. You can't, you can't do that. It's too late because there is people, they lost their life. In some ways, it felt like this country felt like we were superior and we could make our own rules when actually other countries um, had already gone through it and we could listen to their advice. But yeah, for some reason, um, yeah, our government wasn't listening. If society permits one portion of its citizenry to be menaced or destroyed, then, very soon, no one in that society is safe. Collective memory and collective struggles can provide what is needed to expose the shock doctrine and to resist it. I don't think any black, Asian or ethnic minority People should go into the NHS as it is. I just don't think they should. And then they'll change something. I really do. If we just go, no, I don't want to be part of that, they're going to do something. But it's just because we keep just feeding into this system that it's not for us. It was not made for us. It was made off our, off our backs. You know, I, I just don't get it. You make me feel like I don't belong here. The more people that condone, look the other way, um, when racism is happening, and it happens every day to many, many people, when people look the other way, that spreads like a virus. We've had a pandemic of COVID, but actually we're uncovering this pandemic of racism as well. We need to have a conversation about discrimination, about racism, about sexism, but, you know, we can't ignore them. You know, anti-racism being a positive choice we make in our organisations, as opposed to non-discriminatory, 
So, you know, it's dismantling those systems and working with people to change things. It's vitally important now because we can't go through another generation of black nurses being, um, you know, targeted and profiled. There are many people that want to change, you know, many not, you know, many white people, allies, who really do want to change this. To white allies, allies is, you know, I appreciate you and keep speaking out. When you see the injustice, speak it out because you're helping a black nurse. Get up and, and, and go and talk to people and, and go and say to them, knock on the doors and just say, look, we're here. Keep applying for jobs, keep, keep moving forward because it's in their face now, they can't ignore us anymore. For me, midwifery is a calling and it's a passion that it keeps me going because I'm doing it for a reason and I can't give up easily. I know that I love nursing, I love being a nurse and I don't feel that my colour should be a block, an obstacle for me to doing what I'm passionate about and that's caring for people and looking after people. NHS management don't like people that challenge them. But they need to be challenged because if we don't challenge them, the same attitude will continue from my generation to the generation of my children which I don't want. The fight for justice is, is something we should all be doing. I, I don't think it should be reserved for just black people or just white people. I think together, collectively, we do it. And as nurses, I feel that it's not just about us, it's also about our patients and being able to ensure that our patients, we get justice for our patients.